Okay, so we got uh, Arzu. Luis, of course, is here. So we're waiting for Hector and any other, uh, I guess, participants. So let's give it a few minutes before we get started. Yep. Okay, Hector is John. Hello, good morning. Good morning, Hector. Good morning. Okay, I think uh, I think we should go ahead and get started. Um, Brian, you are ready? Unmute yourself. Yes, okay. okay, I'll go ahead and uh, uh, give a quick uh, introduction, and maybe Luis will add a few more uh, words, and then we'll uh, we'll get going. Uh, so first of all, I just want to thank everybody for joining us today for uh, Brian's defense. Um, all of his. Um, uh, friends and colleagues that are on the call, but also his uh, committee, um, Arezu, uh, Hector, and Luis, who is the co-advisor uh, uh, with myself uh, for Brian. Um, just a quick um, um, overview about uh, Brian. Brian joined um, Purdue um, and started working with me on uh, optical flow diagnostics and uh, microscopy type of uh, methods. Um, and in the process, uh, I would say he found his uh, true calling, which was actually um, working more uh, into um, uh, cell and tissue type of work uh, with Luis, uh, and hence uh, got uh, to be co-advised between uh, Luis and uh, myself. Um, in the process, he actually collaborated on a number of projects that you guys are not going to see here. Um, he's only going to focus on uh, uh, the main aspects of his uh, PhD work. But he has contributed on uh, both uh, uh, experimental methods and development, as well as um, experiments with respect to um, cancer cell um, uh, behavior, I guess, motility and analysis and so on. Uh, Brian will also share with us his plans in the future, which are very exciting. And I'm very happy with what he has uh, laid ahead of him um, coming after his PhD. So I'll just pause here. Luis, would you like to add anything? Yeah, um, <clears throat> so I'd like to start by just thanking Brian for all the time he spent in my lab. Um, when I first started uh, at Purdue, uh, having you know someone with Brian's experience level was really instrumental in helping me get off the ground. So I know that my lab would have not been able to really start without Brian's contribution and help. So he, he's been a key contributor for my group for years now. And uh, while this is, a, this is a bit of a bittersweet moment because uh, I'm, I'm happy to see Brian developing and, and progressing and, and moving on, it's gonna be a, a hard loss to, to not have them to rely on and, and use them anymore. So uh, with that, I just am extremely grateful for all the hard work Brian's put into the research. And, and you'll see that he's, he's really contributed a lot in the field and really, uh, I think, advanced the field as a whole. So just I do, thanks, Brian, for all the hard work and effort. Okay, excellent. Okay, well, Brian is uh, your show, take it away. All right. Thank you very much, everyone, for attending my PhD defense presentation today. The title of my dissertation is Microfluidic Velocimetry for Investigating Molecular Transport and Cell Migration. So 
Uh, my overall research introduces methods and application for measuring the dynamics of micro to nanometer size objects such as particles, molecules, and living cells to better understand biological system. So I will first start with the introduction of the nanoparticle flow velocimetry technique using a confocal laser scanning microscope. In the second topic, I will uh, introduce extension of the previous uh, method to be applied for multi-dimensional confocal image correlation. In the third topic, I will introduce our novel cell tracking algorithm used, used to segment and track cells in time-lapse microscopy images. And in the final topic, uh, we have used the cell tracking algorithm to investigate the role of tumor heterogeneity in breast cancer and metastasis. So I, I will go ahead and get started with the first topic to and introduce nanoparticle flow velocimetry with image phase correlation for confocal laser scanning microscope. Confocal laser scanning microscope, CLSM, uh, is one of the most powerful and popular instruments used in biological science, which comes with the advantage of higher spatial resolution and higher contrast with the use of the pinhole compared to the traditional wide field imaging system with larger volume acquisition. And this is further illustrated in the schematic when we, we are trying to take sub uh, area images of the uh, micron scale cells of uh, confocal has absolute advantage uh, with having in focused uh, section of, of the for for imaging. The, so the researchers have not only used confocal laser scanning microscope for taking beautiful static images, but also have come up with the technique called scanning laser image correlation SLIC to measure the dynamics of flowing tracers, such as particles and molecules. So the way this technique works is that it starts with the repeatedly scanning one dimensional line over time. So that will produce two dimensional image as shown here where the X axis represents the scanning direction and the Y axis corresponds to the time series. And the bright diagonal signals that you see from the image, this represents the the 100 nanometer particles uh, flowing in a channel. And by cross-correlating this line across the time series, we can output the mean velocity of the flow. And this system has been used widely for in vitro and in vivo systems of, in, of the biological samples. However, uh, when we actually use this technique with confocal laser scanning microscope, there are significant random matters caused by the Brownian motion of diffusion-dominated particles. And in addition, there is a bias error caused due to the laser scanning movement while particles are flowing. So it is crucial to develop a robust method that reduces these random and bias errors. So here is the flow chart of showing the each imaging steps of our algorithm. So as mentioned previously, this line correlation technique is called SLIC. And then the first five steps shown here is the, um, is the standard uh, ensemble cross correlation technique used to measure the velocity uh, of moving particles. And there are a couple of extra steps involved here where uh, we extract the phase information from the cross correlation and apply the Gaussian spectral filter. This is this particular method is called robust phase correlation, RPC, which was developed from our lab uh, for, mic for micro PIV applications. And what we have done to minimize the random errors is that by optimizing the spectral filter diameter, uh, by analyzing with the synthetically generated confocal laser scanning mic microscope images with the ground truth reference, uh, we have find the optimal spectral filter that works to reduce the random matters of the confocal images. Uh, and the next step is to, to take care of the issue with the bias setters presented in the previous slides. So we have come up with the bias error correction model uh, where the U of F corrected fluid velocity is actually a function of delta X, which is the average velocity after applying the spectral filter uh, and the, the input parameters such as interframe rate delta T 
and also the scanner velocity. And the key parameter here is that the bias error is a function of fluid to scanner velocity ratio. So we started testing our model with the synthetic image analysis. So the plot shown here shows the convergence of the measurement for the two different tra uh, size tracer particles for our method, uh, which is scanning laser image correlation RPC. So abbreviation we're using is SLIC R. And then this, we're comparing with the standard cross correlation shown here as SEC. Uh, what we can see is that um, the blue line here on the plot is the expected fluid to scanner velocity. So what we want is we want our measurement with the minimum possible number of ensemble image pairs to converge to the expected value. And that's what's shown here in the table where from our slick R, we are actually meeting the expected values uh, much faster by a factor of 10 or more compared to the standard cross correlation. And this faster convergence from this slick R is further illustrated in this video here. Uh, where we can see that from the standard cross correlation, the measured versus theoretical peak does not never uh, never really overlaps, uh, and this was the case for seven nanometer particles with significant diffusion. Once we suppress the random errors in our confocal measurements, uh, we still have to take care of the bias errors. So if we don't apply the bias error correction model, we still have substantial errors involved uh, in our measurements. So in this plot, we are showing the error magnitude on the y-axis uh, with respect to varying fluid to scanner velocity ratio on the x-axis. Well, we can see that with all of the slick R measurements uh, that are in line with the expected error predicted from our theoretical model uh, still have errors up to 10 or more pixels. However, after applying the bias error correction model, we can see that all of our markers are below 0.5 pixels errors, which shows a significant improvement. And we continue demonstrating our, uh, our algorithm with the experiment, experimental setup. So we use the microfluidic channels with the syringe pump to flow uh, tracers with two different sizes and image from the confocal. And here are some of the raw images of the uh, scanning laser image, the line correlation uh, that was uh, introduced in the beginning. So what we can see from the 100 nanometer case is that we can see visible uh, diagonal signals pretty clearly. And then uh, the, the correlation strength from the standard cross correlation and also ours as slick R uh, looks pretty distinct and normal. Um, however, when we look at the seven nanometer case, uh, the image looks extremely contaminated. And that's also shown in the, this, uh, the Gaussian shape of the, uh, of the standard cor cross correlation peak. Whereas our, with our slick R measurement, we can still identify a very distinct strength uh, in the correlation peak. And the same uh, type of convergence was assessed here uh, to evaluate how fast uh, the, the measurements converge between the slick R and SCC. Uh, and as we've seen from the synthetic image analysis, we can see that the, uh, for the slick R, it converges faster for both particle size than the traditional uh, standard cross correlation. And also uh, we looked at the effect of the bias error correction. So here is the, the velocity profile uh, Eckhart at the center of the channel showing the parabolic profile. Um, there's quite a lot of markers here, but what I want to highlight is that the, the standard cross correlation measurements shown as the star marker and also the down pointing triangle, they are staying all outside of the confidence band, expected confidence band. Whereas we can see that all of our slick R measurements stay within the uh, relatively close to the confidence band. And after we apply the bias error correction model, uh, the measurements are gets closer to the expected trend in the middle. So to summarize and list the contribution, from this study, we demonstrated that the Brownian motion is the primary driver of the random matters in confocal measurements. We develop optimal slick R filter that maximizes the correlation strengths. And also we found that the bias error depend on the ratio of the fluid to scanning uh, velocity. And to uh, minimize this error, we developed an analytical model of the slick R measurement bias error due to the image scanning. Moving on to the second topic, which uh, extends the, uh, 
the discussion we had to apply for multi-dimensional uh, confocal images. So the um, so the split R measurement algorithm that we have developed is very powerful, but to be more broadly applied, uh, optimally we want we also want to expand. We wanted to expand the method to be applied for two-dimensional and three-dimensional confocal images. However, when there is additional dimension involved, um, the confocal is still uh, forming 2D and 3D volumetric scan based on the point by point scanning. So this will cause even lower temporal resolution than the one dimensional case, therefore increasing the random and bias errors significantly. So the general steps of the, uh, the overall image processing algorithm is same, uh, the two different um, update that we had is with the spectral filter. Um, so previously uh, for the 1D case, we had a fixed diameter of the spectral filter. However, we want to make this uh, filter dynamic. So it will actually change the diameter with respect to different signals uh, in the measurements. So shown here, here is the phase angle plane um, where the smooth bending structures, which is the uh, smooth bending structures represents the, uh, the velocity uh, the actual signals in the images, uh, whereas these uh, smooth bending structures actually decreases with respect to lower size uh, particles. And outside of this bending structure is the high frequency noise where we don't want in our measurements. So by taking the variance of this plane, we can actually uh, calculate a phase quality map where the blue region corresponds to the low variance uh, corresponding to the smooth bending structure representing the actual signals. And then outside of that is the high variance, uh, the noisy regions where we want to filter. Uh, so by thresholding the variance, uh, we developed a dynamic filter uh, that optimally tunes for different measurements of the confocal image pairs. And the next step is to extend the bias error correction model that we developed previously. Uh, so we have extended our bias error model for all of the components of the velocity vector. As you can see, uh, each corrected fluid velocity is a function of the fluid to scanner velocity ratio of the other dimensions and, and the interframe rate. So we call our newer method called scanning laser image correlation phase quality, SLICQ is the abbreviation used, will be used for the remaining plots in the presentations. So we have used similar setup uh, for to demonstrate this case in experiments. So same microfluid channel was used with the syringe pump and two different pressure particles. So the top three videos are showing the 100 nanometer particles flowing from left to right with respect to different measurement plane in the channel. So the bottom video is the three nanometer sized M cherry protein. And because of of the very small size, um, we, what we can see that is the, the video looks like practically contaminated noise uh, due to the lack of uh, signals and significant random errors. Um, and to experiment was demonstrated with the 2D and three-dimensional images in the central location and in the inlet uh, to measure the outer plane velocity. And also for two-dimensional case, uh, we have introduced uh, second component velocity vector by rotating the microfluidic channel with respect to scanning direction. So here is the convergence plot. Uh, as we discussed previously with the one dimensional case also, uh, we are comparing quite a lot of things on this plot, which is synthetic and experiment and also two different size um, particles for the sleek Q measurement versus the SEC. Uh, but what I want to highlight is that the blue lines shows the expected normalized displacement um, and all of the black markers represents our sleek Q measurements, which actually shown in this table of convergence where all of the 2D and 3D images, uh, 3D cases actually converge, even with the three nanometer M cherry case. Whereas the red markers representing the standard cross correlation SCC, what you can see is that only the 100 nanometer two dimensional case was converged and all of the other case stayed in the zero displacement uh, showing uh, that the measurement did not converge uh, due to the significant uh, random work. 
continuing with the uh, with to look at the effect of the bias error correction. So this plot is showing the error magnitude with respect to fluid to scanner velocity ratio uh, in uh, in z direction. So um, what I want to highlight here is that all of the blue lines show the expected errors based on our bias error correction model, and all of the unfilled black markers represents our sleek measurements that are in line with these bias setters. So after applying the, the error correction model, we can see all of the field black, black and gray markers stay uh, with below 0.5 pixels error magnitude, which shows uh, substantial improvement. Now we demonstrated the effect of the bias setter with two dimensional experimental case. Once again, the blue lines are expected velocity. Uh, so from the top plot, where we have the flow direction in line with the scanner direction, we can see that the all of the three nanometer uh, standard cross correlation uh, measurements are staying in the zero displacement due to the unconvergence, whereas all of the uncorrected and also the corrected sleek measurements are staying within the confidence band. For the middle and bottom plot, which shows the case for the rotated angle with the introduction of the second component in the velocity vector, we can start seeing that the effect of bias errors are much substantial. So we see that the black on field markers are from the slick queue without the bias error correction, but all of the field markers, uh, the black field markers stay within the confidence band. Uh, and also the same case for the 90 degrees rotation and we can still see that the, all of the SCC measurements in red markers are in the zero displacement due to unconvergence. And same type of uh, plots are shown here for the 3D experimental cases. The center plot is the uh, velocity measurements at the center of the, um, of the microfluidics channel. Uh, we can see all of the SCC measurements staying in the zero displacement due to unconvergence. For the inlet measurements, we're seeing higher effect of the bias error correction uh, as expected and still seeing the SCC velocity at the zero displacement. And to list the summary and major contributions, uh, we were able to um, improve our original method to be applied for multi-dimensional uh, velocity measurements with confocal laser scanning microscope. And this uh, method is novel and has many applications, can be used for applications in designing of the micro to nanoscale flow experiments. And the spectral filter that, that we have used for this method can be also used for the PIV images acquired with the wide field images and not only the confocal uh, that uh, with extremely low signals. Moving to the next topic. Uh, so the first two topics uh, I have covered the image based velocimetry techniques. And starting with the, uh, the third topic, I will introduce segmentation-based tracking technique uh, called multi-parametric feature-based cell tracking in time-lapse microscopy. So cell growth and motility are essential factors in many physiological process. Uh, for example, alteration in the extracellular matrix and also pathophysiological process such as cancer metastasis. So in order to research these biological system, development of accurate and automated cell detection and motility tracking tool is crucial. However, we have found that the current state of the art uh, tracking, published tracking algorithms were unable to accurately detect and track the existing cells uh, in, time, uh, in time series. So we have developed a novel tracking method called multi-parametric cell tracking and in, in this top presentation, uh, I will be comparing the performance of the tracking of our method against two of the most widely cited uh, open source tracking tools called Mosaic and TrackMate. So here are the different benchmark cases that we have tested to look at the performance of these algorithm. First, we use the synthetic published cell image generator called Mitogen. Uh, and in this video is showing the proliferation and migration of the leukemia cells. And we have also used our in-house synthetic cell image generator to uh, take a deep dive on variation of many different parameters such as motility and features of the cells, uh, including intensity, diameter, and size. Also experimental images were tested 
Uh, the videos shown here on the bottom left is the, the published case showing the pancreatic stem cells proliferating and migrating on a 2D substrate. And also our experimental data uh, acquired in our lab, uh, these are the mesenchymal tumor cells migrating through the 3D collagen matrix. So the in-house synthetic cell image generator we have uh, allows control of the cell division and deaths. Also feature variations such as the intensity change, orientation and, and diameter variation uh, of each individual cell. And also we can control the motion precisely. So the picture static uh, images shown on the right is uh, in the top row that shows the synthetic uh, uh, qualitative images of the generated cells, uh, uh, cell images. And bottom row is the experimental case uh, uh, of the two different cell phenotype, Hubeck and the other cell phenotype, which uh, they are in good agreement qualitatively. So moving on to describing how the conventional um, algorithms detect and track the cells. So both mosaic and track made uses single, thre single intensity thresholding approach, which is simply uh, um, it's the, it's the user can actually input a percentile for the peak intensity. So the top row is showing what happens if you set for the 1% of the peak intensity. We can see that during the initial time point, all of the cells have pretty evenly distributed strong signals so that uh, actually the algorithms can detect most of the existing cells. However, in the final time point, after sufficient time has passed and feature variation has encountered, and also the signal levels, we can see that the algorithm fails to detect the, all of the existing cells. Uh, and the opposite case is observed in the bottom where the, the user can actually input you know, lower thresholds, such as 50% instead, to be able to detect most of the existing cells for the final time point. But then what will happen is that for initial time point, um, the algorithm will actually end up over segmenting and picking up the background noise as an existing cell. Once the detection is completed, uh, the tracking from these two algorithms are done um, with the nearest neighbor uh, combined with a couple other features such as peak intensity, diameter, and area extracted from the user input-based circular mask. And here I want to introduce the image processing step for our multi-parametric algorithm. So that we have a three main categories of steps, pre-processing, segmentation, and tracking. Pre-processing is an important step, but often neglected in many other uh, segmentation and cell tracking algorithms. Here, uh, ideally we want our raw images to have very high signal to noise ratio, but oftentimes that is very difficult with the uh, live cell images uh, due to their cell feature variation and also other factors uh, due to the limitations from the instruments. So what we have done is we applied background subtraction across the time series and moving average filters spatially to prevent false alarm in cell detection. And oftentimes we will see signal decay over time for the live cell images uh, due to the the cells actually changing their signals uh, with their shape variation or proliferation or death, but also uh, other factors such as the photobill. So we apply the linear intensity stretch in order to prevent under detection due to signal decay. Next steps involve the segmentations. So the pre-processed raw images are down samples to further smooth the signal heterogeneity. And then the Haitian filter uh, is uh, is done by applying the Haitian matrix. Haitian matrix shown here as the, the partial derivative matrix and the eigen vectors and values represent the, the, uh, the structures that we want in the images such as bright tubular structures and bright blob circular structures shown with the large lambda two values. Uh, so we filter all of the background except for the core bodies uh, of, the, uh, of, the, of each individual cells. Then we begin our core segmentation. And the first step is called erosion process, which is a separate method that has been published from our lab to be used for segmentation of the particles and uh, tracking uh, for particle tracking velocimetry studies. 
So the erosion process basically identifies in each individual local peaks by eroding the intensity maps until individual peaks are found, even with the significant variation in the signal levels. So with this process, we can effectively detect even under high density and cluster of cells. And this step overcomes the intercellular signal heterogeneity. And the next step is the dilation process. So from the identified local peaks, we dilate the boundary of the core body of the cell until it meets the, uh, the edges detected, detected by the edge detections. So with these steps, it prevents over or, and also under segmentation due to irregular shape of cells that are within close proximity. Once the segmentation um, step is completed, now that we ex extract the features uh, in addition to the position to the centroid position of the cells, including the area orientation, mean intensity, as well as major and minor axis of the elliptical fit as shown in the schematic. So we use these features to identify the most probable matching candidate based on the one candidate with the minimum deviation in these features across the image pair. And then from the raw trajectories, we can start quantifying uh, many useful information such as velocity of each individual cell, the net displacement they traveled over time, also the accumulated total displacement. We also use measure of accuracy uh, to evaluate the performance of our, our uh, algorithms. So the yield rate is the ratio of the number of measure vectors uh, versus number of true vectors. And the reliability is the ratio of the number of correct vectors by the number of measure vectors, uh, which represents the, the tracking performance. And also the final measurement efficiency is the com combination of the yield rate and uh, the product of the yield rate and reliability. So here are the, here is the, the segmentation results for the initial and time point uh, showing qualitatively uh, how are the cells being detected across three different algorithms. Uh, so with the synthetic images generated from the mitogen, uh, we can see that the, for initial time point, all three algorithms were able to detect majority of the existing cells. Whereas the final time point where significant change has been encountered with respect to signals, as well as shape change and variations in these cells, track made in mosaic starts to uh, unable to detect all of the existing cells. And this is further demonstrated in the um, in quantitative plot showing the number of detected cells over the, over the entire image sequence. We can see that the, our multi-parametric algorithm MP close, uh, follow closely the ground truth reference shown by the black line Whereas both trackmate and mosaic starts to decrease uh, actually in their counting with respect to the ground truth values beyond um, image number 20, where a lot of the feature variations uh, had actually start to initiate. And the second plot shown here on the right is the total displacement measure per each individual cell identified and ranked on the x-axis. What we can see is that from the trackmate and mosaic uh, starts showing um, under displacement of the total uh, total displacement measure due to the uh, the lack of the full segmentation as well as the um, the incorrect pair matching that they have done, and that is further demonstrated here in the cell pairing effectiveness measure. So uh, as discussed before, we are using the E of Y yield rate, reliability, and the final measurement efficiency. We can see that from all three measure of accuracy multi-parametric uh, outperformed trackmate and mosaic. Next, uh, we continue to analyze synthetic image, images generated from our in-house code, uh, showing that the, uh, the similar trend. So for the initial time point, all of the existing cells are being, uh, being detected by all three methods. But for the final time point, significant under detection has been encountered from trackmate and mosaic. Uh, which is further demonstrated in the quantitative plots. And also from the total displacement measure, uh, we can see that our, uh, our algorithm MP uh, closely follows the ground truth reference where track and mosaic actually uh, has lower total displacement measure. And we can see similar trend and also from the final efficiency measure uh, where multi-parametric continue to outperform 
other algorithms uh, in each measure of accuracy. And we also wanted to exclusively test the tracking performance without the effect of the detection efficiency. Uh, so we have generated separate images from our in-house code where all three algorithms were able to detect all the existing cells across the images. So we are only uh, evaluating the tracking uh, itself. So plot on the left shows the measurement efficiency E of F uh, with respect to different normalized displacement comparing multi-parametric track mate and on mosaic, but also the NN refers to the nearest neighbor, which is the most basic form of tracking by selecting the candidate that is, that is nearby. The plot in the middle shows how the measurement efficiency changed for all these four approaches uh, across the feature change, including orientation, mean intensity, and diameter of each individual cells. And the third plot on the right is with respect to cell density change, how the measurement e efficiency uh, is being reflected. So what we can see is that both Mosaic and TrackMain did not show significant improvement over nearest neighbor, even though they do have additional features that is combined uh, for their tracking. And they were only able to show some improvement for limited condition where extremely low normalized displacement was induced or when the cell density is very low, which is expected to be performed well for any type of tracking algorithms. Whereas we can see that multi-parametric um, algorithm outperform track main mosaic and also nearest neighbor, uh, even under significant feature and motility variation as seen um, by these uh, parameter uh, variation. Then we continue to look at the experimental cases. This is the, um, the published experimental case of pancreatic stem cell migration on a 2D substrate. And we can see a similar trend here with the initial time point, all of the existing cells are being detected across all algorithms. And for the final time point, uh, we have significant under detection observed from TrackMate and Mosaic. Uh, and for the experimental images, uh, we cannot have uh, you know, full ground truths for the, so all of the solution and cell counting. However, we have used manual uh, counting as our uh, reference uh, to verify at discrete time points where we can see that our multi-parametric uh, agrees uh, in general follows well, close to the manual count, whereas TrackMate and Mosaic uh, undercounts uh, after image sequence 100 where significant feature variations start to get initiated. And we can see that the much lower total displacement measure from TrackMate and Mosaic as seen from the second plot. And this is further uh, demonstrated here in the, the map, three maps I'm showing here, which is the overlay trajectories across all images series. And we can start spotting a lot of the empty regions from the TrackMate and Mosaic uh, due to lack of tracking. This is the final case we evaluated for, uh, for the experimental demonstration. Uh, this was the breast tumor cell migration within a 3D hydrogel, where the cells were seated on the left edge of the image as shown here. Um, and as time goes on, uh, the cells were migrate from the left to right size. And, the, and these mesenchymal cells actually squeeze through the pores of the collagen. So what you can see is significant shape variation has been encountered. So both TrackMate and Mosaic start to only detect fragments of each individual cells instead of the core body. And this is reflected in the quantitative plot of number of detected cells over the image sequence. And also from the total displacement measure, we can see a severely lower total displacement measure from the TrackMate and Mosaic uh, due to the lack of tracking, and that's also represented in the overlay trajectories across all image series. To summarize and list out the major contributions, our multi-parametric algorithm were able to accurately detect and track cells even while undergoing, even with the presence of significant spatial and temporal disparity in the cell features. Our algorithm outperformed two most widely published algorithms, Mosaic and TrackMe, and also our synthetic uh, cell image generator developed in our lab can be used in conjunction with the tracking tool as a pre-experimental analysis to set the most optimal uh, uh, 
experimental parameters. Now, moving on to my final topic, uh, where uh, we have you apply the cell tracking tool that we have just discussed to investigate the role of tumor heterogeneity in breast cancer metastasis. In vivo studies have shown that heterogeneous tumors show significantly greater metastasis shown here on the image uh, where the heterogeneous tumors were injected and um, the, uh, the luminescence showing the, um, the effect of the metastasis on day 95. And compare when we look at the, the homogeneous tumors where the epithelial and mesenchymal tumor cells are separately injected, we were not seeing um, uh, as significant effect as with the heterogeneous case. So we, and this is, this is a very significant change. However, uh, we wanted to further understand what is happening uh, between day zero and day 95, and what kind of interactions are being encountered between epithelial and mesenchymal tumor cells. First, uh, the main difference between the epithelial and mesenchymal cells is that epithelial cells are, have, uh, are mostly present in the lining of the organs and vessels. So they are tightly uh, junctioned together with each other. Uh, and, it, and one of the bio, biological markers that is commonly present in epithelial cells is called e cadherin representing the, the junctions that are the green markers uh, shown in the cartoon. And for mesenchymal cells, uh, mesenchymal cells are known for highly motile and invasive, which epithelial cells are not. Uh, and they have a strong expression of the biological markers such as vimentin, which is actually shown here in the orange line, uh, in, in line with the cytoskeletal structure uh, that is uh, present in the highly motile mesenchymal cell. And one other thing that differentiate the epithelial and mesenchymal tumor cells is the expression of the extracellular matrix protein called fibronectin. So here is showing the Western blot uh, results where the mesenchymal tumor cells, CA1H, shows strong expression of the fibronectin, where the epithelial cell, CA1A, does not. And there has been evidence that overall breast cancer breast cancer patient survival decreased with respect to high level of fibronectin found from the patient samples. So we wanted to further understand the role of fibronectin within heterogeneous tumors. Uh, the research gaps uh, is that we do not understand how the non-migratory epithelial tumor cells were able to metastasize instead of the mesenchymal uh, counterpart. Uh, we want to understand the interaction between these two cell phenotypes. Uh, and in order to do that, uh, it requires tumor cell growth and motility at single cell level. And such quantification is actually difficult to achieve with the, with the conventional tracking algorithms because the tumor, in vitro tumor cell images often contains high cell density, also significant shape variation, as well as the signal image signal to noise ratio change uh, due to uh, these variables. Therefore, we have used our multi-parametric cell tracking system with the microfluidic-based assay to investigate this question. So this is a microfluidics platform shown here. Uh, we have used mixture of the cells with the hydrogel embedded uh, shown in the microfluidic uh, channel section, which is in between two different reservoirs causing the chemo attracting effect and shown here is the images of the two cell populations that are co-culture labeled with different fluorescent marker. And concurrently, we also use biological assays such as immunostaining and Western blood to further confirm the biological response in addition to the dynamic response we get from the cell tracking. And here is the list of conditions we tested. Uh, for the monoculture groups, we have CA1A epithelial cells CA1H mesenchymal tumor cells, and the CA1A culture with the soluble fibronectin in the media. For the co-culture group, we have different ratio of the mixture of epithelial to mesenchymal tumor cells as shown here. And also the epithelial cells co-culture with the fib fibronectin that is genetically depleted from the mesenchymal cells. Based on this, 
uh, assays, we expect that cell proliferation, migration velocity, and distance will increase uh, with respect to fibronectin exposure. Uh, we expect from based from the biological assays, there will be lowered e cadherin and increased vimentin upon fibronectin exposure, indicating signs of epithelial to mesenchymal transition EMT. <clears throat> so here are the raw images of comparing the monoculture versus co-culture groups. We can see that the significant uh, survival difference between the two groups, where by day five, majority of the existing epithelial cells have died uh, due to nutrient starvation. Uh, however, for the co-culture group, actually the epithelial cells with the mesenchymal cells overcome uh, this challenge and actually continue to increase their proliferation over uh, up to day five. So in the quantitative plot, what we can see is that the green markers represents the, the co-culture groups. Uh, and uh, what we can see from the, uh, the red unfilled marker, which is the monoculture epithelial cells. Uh, and also the, the epithelial cells culture with fibronectin mesenchymal cells shown in the black line here, uh, the proliferation starts decreasing beyond day two, uh, due, mainly due to the nutrient uh, depleted conditions. Uh, whereas we can see that the monoculture, uh, monoculture epithelial cells with soluble fibronectin were actually able to improve their survival while the, the effect wasn't as much as the co-culture groups. On the other side with the mesenchymal tumor cells, uh, we did not see as significant uh, increase in the proliferation from the mesenchymal cells as much as we did with the epithelial counterparts. Uh, however, uh, from when the fibronectin was depleted from the mesenchymal cells, we can see that the proliferation actually decreased beyond day one and a half, which shows similar trend we've seen from the epithelial cells. So overall from the growth uh, evaluation of the cell growth, uh, we, we're seeing that fibronectin exposure increased survival and growth of the epithelial tumor cells. Next, uh, we evaluated the velocity magnitude of monoculture and co-culture groups. Uh, from the epithelial cells uh, plot here, we can see that all of the co-culture groups in the green markers, as well as the red field markers representing the epithelial cells with the soluble fibronectin had uh, increased in their velocity magnitude, whereas the, the monoculture groups and the co-culture with the fibronectin depleted uh, mesenchymal cells uh, showing the trend where their migration velocity decreased beyond day two. On the other side, uh, for the mesenchymal tumor cells, uh, all of the field green markers were not seeing a significant, significant increase uh, in the velocity magnitude as we did with the epithelial cells. Whereas when the fibronectin was decreted, uh, the initially increased velocity start to decrease, uh, which is a trend similar to what we are seeing on, with the epithelial counterparts. So overall, the fibronectin exposure made the epithelial tumor cells migrate faster. And we, are, and we also looked at the migration, total migration distance from different culture groups. Here is qualitatively showing the raw trajectories. Uh, on the left side, uh, the trajectories from the originally seeded positions uh, for the epithelial cells, monoculture versus the co-culture groups. We can clearly see that the black lines uh, with uh, with larger, longer migra migration distance compared to the monoculture groups shown in the red lines. Uh, however, we did not see substantial effect and migration difference for the mesenchymal cells, whether they were monoculture or co-culture. But when the fibronectin was depleted from the mesenchymal cells, uh, we started seeing that the migration distance was substantially decreased shown by the blue lines. And this is further demonstrated in quantitative bar plots here uh, for the epithelial and mesenchymal tumor cells. Uh, we can see that uh, clearly that the monoculture epithelial cells and the co-culture with the fibronectin depleted cells had much uh, shorter migration distance compared to all of the other groups. Uh, and same is shown for the mesenchymal tumor cells. When the fibronectin was depleted, uh, their migration distance was substantially a lower than the other co-culture or monoculture groups. So overall, the fibronectin exposure enhanced uh, the dissemination of the epithelial tumor cells. Here is showing our uh, biological assays. So the three uh, 
images are shown. Uh, these are the confocal images for immunostaining uh, to verify the expression of the fibronectin in different cell phenotype. So this, uh, the red uh, marker shows the fibronectin strongly being expressed from the mesenchymal tumor cells, uh, whereas uh, we're seeing the absence of fibronectin from epithelial cells as well as fibronectin depleted mesenchymal tumor cells. And in the uh, bottom right corner, uh, this is the Western blot to look at the effect of change in the biomarkers, e cadherin and vimentin after exposing the epithelial tumor cells to 10 microgram per milliliter of soluble fibronectin. Uh, interestingly, what we saw, what we observed is that e cadherin expression was maintained even after the exposure to fibronectin. However, we started seeing a very strong expression of the vimentin, which is typically found in the mesenchymal cells. Uh, but now that these epithelial cells with the fibronectin expression uh, started to have strong expression of the vimentin, uh, which indicates that it is possible that the soluble fibronectin uh, potentially induce partial EMT of the whole population or full EMT for smaller subpopulation of the epithelial tumor cells tested. Now to list of uh, summary and major contributions. Um, the pro-invasion mesenchymal CA1H cells, uh, we saw that it has a protective effect on the pro-growth epithelial CA1A cells, uh, which otherwise died after two days in nutrient-starved conditions. We observed that adding soluble fibronectin alone to the pro-growth CA1A cells was sufficient to improve the survival, although the advantage was not as great as the co-culture groups. And overall, uh, we, our data clearly shows that fibronectin signaling enhanced growth, motility, and phenotypic differentiation of epithelial tumor cells. I would like to briefly mention, uh, um, outside of my dissertation, uh, other projects that I've worked together. Uh, this is the Lily sponsor projects. I have worked closely with uh, many colleagues uh, to measure the mass recovery of the monoclonal antibody drugs across a biological barrier. Uh, one is the, the tissue barrier, two-dimensional cell monolayer barrier, also 3D ECM vascular network. And also the development of our cell tracking tool has attracted many collaborations outside of my dissertation. And this video here is showing the in vivo uh, hemolymph flow tracking in the insect circulate, circulatory system. So to summarize the overall contributions uh, of, of my research work, um, we have improved the accuracy of the confocal uh, laser scanning microscope-based nanoparticle flow measurement. We have developed a novel single cell identification and feature-based tracking algorithm. Also in conjunction with the uh, microfluidic heterogeneous tumor microenvironment system. Uh, and we have, by using this, uh, using this technological innovations, we have quantified microenvironmental factors for breast cancer metastasis. And through the Lilly projects, uh, we characterize vascular permeability factors that can be useful for future design of drug delivery system. Here is the list of publications uh, out of my dissertation, uh, as well as the Lilly work. And I would like to take a minute to uh, acknowledge uh, everyone I'm very thankful for Professor Vlahos and Professor Solorio for their mentorship and support over many years. Thank you, Professor Adikani and Professor Gomez for serving uh, as my thesis committee members, as well as collaboration through Lilly projects. I would like to thank uh, previous uh, lab member, Matt Giara, Hai Sheng, and Professor Main from uh, medical science department for their contributions in the nanoparticle flow velocimetry projects. Significant effort has been made uh, from Adi Bentianchi uh, to make the cell tracking algorithm uh, work. I, uh, much thanks to Sarah, Monica, Aparna, Juan, uh, and other members uh, of Professor Wen's research group uh, for our collaboration on the heterogeneous tumor microenvironment. I have worked very closely with Mazin, Kevin, and Adib on many different aspects of the Lilly projects. 
I would also like to thank Mary and Professor Soha from Virginia Tech on the collaboration of the insect flow tracking, also help from Brett for uh, flow analysis. I would like to thank every members of the Vlahos lab and Solorio lab, uh, and I'm really looking forward to uh, seeing um, upcoming progress made from all of the new students. Um, Thank you for the departmental support from ME, BME, and also the imaging instruments I've used from um, the Bioscience Center. Thank you for support from family and friends. Uh, special thanks to my wife, Haywon, for supporting me through many years of graduate school, family members all over the world, and friends from friends I made from Purdue and IU. With that, uh, I would like to conclude my talk and open up for questions and comments. Okay, great. Thanks, Brian. Um, we will open it up uh, for questions from the audience. I got uh, one quick comment, though. Um, excellent presentation. And the conclusions is the first time that it rivaled the Oscar speeches right now with uh, you acknowledging everybody. I wish we had the music to drop in at the end uh, <laughs> for, your, for your final. So, uh, okay, so let's uh, open up for questions from the audience. Um, we got uh, about uh, 18, uh, well, uh, 15 plus people. So um, whoever feels uh, you have a question, unmute and go ahead and ask. You guys don't be shy. <laughs> I guess we don't have any questions. Okay. Okay. You uh, you did an excellent job and everything was clear, so I think that explains that. Okay. So if um, if there's no questions from the audience, um, uh, Brian now is going to uh, uh, meet with his committee. So I would ask the audience to step out, and Brian will uh, will stay with uh, uh, with uh, the committee. Hector, Arzu, Luis, and I. Thank you everybody for joining. Thank you everyone. Um, Brian, you can go ahead and stop the recording also. Okay. One minute. One minute.